Good for you. Yeah, we can all set up and sort things. Oh, can we do that? Can we we are live, turn, right? Woohoo! I just then never can find us quickly enough on Facebook. Let's find us. Oh my gosh. There we are. Oh, good. I just saw Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Steve the graphic. snail. Okay, let's see. I'm hoping it wouldn't be that easy just to give us a notification right now. Oh, there it is. Yay. Yeah, it's so <laughs> slow sometimes to let you know that, that there's peeps and that you're online. My computer's going slow. Oh, uh, I'm going to have to tag. What do I need? Uh, and it won't let I, my name on Facebook is uh, it's going to be yeah, my old name for a while. Somebody's trying to blooming spam yeah. us. That's really annoying. Might let us oh, so I know. I share this to my page. Maybe I gotta do it the manual way. It's being funny. Facebook is being a funny, funny thing. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> typical oh, i came away and it was like two people i've come back and it's 29 hello 29 Woo! lovely people so that was nice and quick so um so we're just doing our normal thing of letting it fill up and obviously sharing to different places um sai you're in the um comment section can you do me a favor somebody is being naughty and trying to link this event as if it's not access does that make sense like they're um click here to go to this event when they don't need to does that make sense i'm assuming because it's behind that it does make sense um so sorry we are we are here we're just um sorting our pages and sharing things out so um hello <laughs> laurel hello hannah hello Lai. i think hello. i've just accidentally shared something to the academy page oh fair enough <laughs> <laughs> It's it's all it's all different to what I'm used to. Hang on. Uh -huh. Hello, Leslie, Austin, Spectrum Life, Victoria, Samara, Cynthia. Hello, lovely people. And Steve, don't forget Steve. <laughs> and Andrew. And Victoria, I can't do everybody, but still hi. Um, I think we're just waiting for David to um, also share. All right, I got it. It worked. It happened. Annoyingly, I can't even minimize that. Sorry, in what I wanted to tag him in to show him the person being a bit dodgy. What if I can just block them? Shady, shady, shady. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. It's on. Let's have a look. If you're if you've got the laptop open, if you go into the business suite and look on uh, Facebook's odd notifications, there's somebody called Mommy Actor, and they're doing that thing where they're like, go here. It's weird. Oh, Ian! I haven't seen Ian forever and he's got a potato. <laughs> okay. David. Yeah, you... I'm done. I'm done. You're done? Okay. <laughs> J.R. Reed loves the word dodgy. Oh, hey, J.R. Speaking of uh, someone with a fantastic purple beard. <laughs> ah, okay. Are they American? Is that why they, they like the word dodgy? Because it's something we would have said. Oh, maybe. Yeah, are you American? You're American, aren't you? You're American. I don't know. I'm going to get that wrong. Uh, I should know. <laughs> I should know failing as a friend okay so david uh, yeah hi uh welcome to our academy live stream with lyric um and uh yeah i am david gray hammond i'm one of your presenters with me is chloe faraha dr chloe faraha um, and uh lyric holmans so uh, yeah, let's let's jump straight in. Lyric, who are you, and what are your specialisations or special interests? Yeah, 
Uh, so, Lyric, yes, uh, I'm a multiply neurodivergent adult, uh, and by multiply diver neurodivergent, I mean I am autistic and I also have ADHD, but I didn't find out I was um, neurodivergent until I was 29. So that's a really big impact on my life. And I am someone who started into the workplace early. So work has actually kind of been one of my early passions and interests. Uh, and so in that, it's led me to, you know, one of my early jobs, other than after working in the family business, which got me a really good start uh, in life, was uh, a roller skating car hop, which was really fun. Uh, and you know, not a lot of responsibility, but so fun. And then I ended up working up from there to managing fast food. Uh, and then I worked in retail for a while. I worked in um, computer materials management. I worked in corporate and business consulting. And now I am, uh, I own my own uh, consulting and training company. So uh, my passion has really been around uh, educating workplaces about their organizational culture. Uh, and specifically a lot of things that they wouldn't think of that are un unintentionally causing harm to neurodivergent populations within their workplaces and helping them fix those systems. But a lot of it, uh, because the first step is education, revolves around education. Excellent. And uh, you sort of touched on this, but when did you discover you were autistic? Yeah, so... I, I discovered I was autistic when I was 29, and that's because I had been actually going through workplace burnout, and I was making myself really sick, you know, that square peg round hole situation where if you're, you know, neurodivergent, but you don't know you're neurodivergent, you hold yourself to neurotypical standards, and you think you are an inferior neuro neurotypical person often, and so that was the case with myself personally. And so I was pushing myself really hard, you know, a square peg round hole, damaging the peg, destroying the peg, um, so as to speak. And learning that I was neurodivergent at 29 was just that sh shift that helped me get my life back on track. And then uh, I only recently got that ADHD diagnosis that actually earlier this year at the age of 33, so like four and a half years later. And I'm still like processing what that means to me, but that's been suggested to me many times in my life since I was a very young person. And once other people that are ADHD started to, to suggest it to me, I was like, okay, I'm going to listen because if a bunch of autistic people started to suggest I was autistic, I would listen to them, <laughs> you know? So, and, and I decided to investigate that further. Uh, so it, it's just interesting to see. And, you know, since my space in the community, how many people my age and especially older are finding out late in life that they are neurodivergent because when we were younger uh there's a lot of reasons a lot of us may have not been have been diagnosed especially in you know the, old, the older we get okay um right well i think you you have a presentation for us don't you i do yeah i'm really excited I, to see this, so uh, and i'm sure chloe is as well so um i think what we're going to do is chloe and i are going to mute ourselves and turn off our cameras and then uh, you can share your presentation with us. Uh, just to check, Chloe, you have enabled screen sharing, haven't you? I have, yeah. And yeah. I'm going to sit here and make some um, notes if there's any like questions that I've got. But obviously, um, people in the comment section, if while you're listening, you've got any questions or comments that you would like us to direct to Lyric, because Lyric can't actually see the comments. Um, if you can just put, put like three asterisks and then Lyric's name. So I'll just show you what I mean in the comment section. And then David and I can grab those and ask them um, and or pin them. And so I'll make some notes as we're going along. Lovely. Good. I've also made awesome. a note to come back to roller skating. To talk oh, OK. Yeah, skating. sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. That, that's a long time, Howie. Uh, let, let, me, let me get this screen share going then. Um, I'm going to mute myself and oh. turn off my camera. Awesome, thank you. I'm just going to so stay so that Lyric knows that the presentation's sharing, okay? Okay, perfect. You fantastic I so. feelings. I appreciate you so much. I haven't got the, let me get into the correct mode for us. All right. It so should go there. You see it now? It's a black screen at the moment. Oh, hang on, let's see. If it's not, hang on. Um, I may have to walk up and do something here. Is it, did it fix by any chance? Is it still a black screen? Still black screen, sadly. Okay, hang on. 
hopefully I'll try most people way. and particularly if they're, the, if they're in the uk will understand have you tried turning it off and on again which is a terrible irish question. Like, no yeah <laughs> um what you know i don't know what's annoying is my screen controls went to the tv that's really far away and i can't see that far so um hang on let me oh actually i can unplug this we're gonna walk over there so i can see <laughs> a good thing about the wireless headphones right okay thank you so much humans for your patience Typically, when I'm trying to wait for something to work on my laptop, when I'm trying to deliver training, I just sort of make my own little theme tune <laughs> while people are watching. So I'm like, do, 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 do. Well, it's really funny that it's not. Can you put it on your key screen or? Um... Is it worth stopping sharing and just trying again? Do you, what do you see right now? If you move Is a cursor, I think it's still a black screen, but with a little cursor over it. Well, if, if we can't get visuals, I will, I will do it without visuals. Uh, but this is, I'm going to try one more thing. And if this doesn't work, there's some kind of technology thing going on that I've never experienced before. And we're going to just do it without the visuals. What do you see right now? Still black screen and can't Other than see me. you. Your camera's... Oh, there's well, you. Okay. I, I turned me off. Okay. Because that was us. I was walking around. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to scrap the visuals. Um, and I will... It will be my face. Is that okay? Absolutely. Can, can we stand seeing my face for a while, humans? <laughs> um no okay all right uh so um, oh sorry do you want to stop, we... stop sharing so it makes you bigger oh yeah actually no good idea oh and it went back up there okay you get to walk around with me i really like that far it's doing some funny thing and i appreciate everyone's patience you, you gotta love technology uh especially when it doesn't do what you want it to do right okay Alrighty, we're here and I am so grateful for all of your patience. Uh, my name is Lyric. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a late diagnosed multiply neurodivergent adult, meaning I am diagnosed autistic and ADHD. Um, and I, autism is a lifelong difference. And even though I didn't know I was autistic, hang on, TV's doing play. All right. There we go. All righty. Hang on, it's just switching around. Okay. So, hmm. all right. So even though I didn't know I was autistic, all of my life and the moments in it have been influenced by that experience. And my presentation and the ways in which I cope and interact in the world are gonna change and evolve as they do with every autistic person, uh, but I'm always gonna be autistic. Uh, and some of you may know me from the Neurodivergent Rebel blog, uh, neurodivergentrebel.com. And that blog was a way for me to process this late diagnosis after I found out I was autistic at the age of 29. Um, and then, you know, I'm also the founder of Neurodivergent Consulting, which we mentioned uh, is an organization that I started to help educate and change a lot of the myths and misunderstandings that we see in the world about autistic and neurodivergent people. So when I am educating inside organizations and workspaces, we often are going to be talking about a neurodiversity perspective. And we use neurodiversity as a tool to empower within the workplace. And neurodiversity is not something that I made up. Neurodiversity is something that has been around long before I found out I was autistic or neurodivergent. And it is a term that was coined in the late 1990s by Judy Singer. And Judy is an autistic sociologist. And Judy argued that diverse neurological conditions and learning disabilities, specifically autism, dyslexia, dyscalculia, hyperlexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, Tourette's syndrome, 
all of which are actually more common in autistic people, are the result of normal variations in human brain types. So I like to say different shades of humanity. And when we're talking about neurodiversity, it rejects this idea that autism and other neurological processing differences should be cured. And we're challenging a prevailing view that neurological diversity is inherently bad or pathological. Now, unfortunately, society systems have been set up by the neuromajority. That is neurotypical people. And that means we haven't had a lot of input in these systems from neurodivergent people. And that's because for a long time, neurodivergent people have been pathologized. We've been told that we are broken and we've been asked to try harder to fit in instead of flexing some of these systems so that we can find solutions that may work well for everyone and create truly inclusive spaces and systems. Now, when we look at numbers for neurodivergence, because there are so many different uh, conditions that fall within this spectrum, one in eight people are considered neurodivergent. And as you know, we talked about earlier, some may not even know it. You know, I, I didn't find out until I was almost 30. So that's a large portion of my life. And it was almost picked up on when I was in elementary school because the education system was the, one of the first systems that I came up against that I struggled a lot with. And when it was suggested by the school that I might have a learning disability, my guardians declined having me tested because the way the school had approached them was that there might be something wrong with that kid. And if you are talking to a family of undiagnosed neurodivergent people who I very closely resemble, the idea that the school was wanting to say that there was something wrong with me and put you know, in their eyes a label that could maybe do harm to me or a label that there was something wrong with me was completely off the table. They were never gonna let that happen. So because of the stigma and the way the school approached getting help, it was never, it, we didn't go further with it. And I then entered the workforce in my teens, as I mentioned briefly, working first in the family business. And then I moved on to work in fast food and eventually uh, corporate before getting into HR operations and now business consulting. And most of my professional career was spent not knowing that I was neurodivergent because these differences in the way our minds work are actually invisible. And that meant I wasn't properly accommodated in most of the workspaces I was entering. And back then, I wouldn't have even known what to ask for because I didn't truly understand how much my needs varied from the needs of people around me. And this is one of the main reasons I began my work with organizations, asking them to change things based on how they recruit, how they write policies and design physical spaces. And this is so that we can create workspaces that work regardless if someone is disclosing their neurodivergence or not. And the truth is, as, as, I, as I said earlier, there, there's a lot of people my age and older who may be neurodivergent and not even know it. And so, I've personally met people who are discovering that they are neurodivergent in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. So neurodivergent people are already in the workplace right now. And you know, with the, the status of one in eight people, if you've got at least eight employees in your workplace, you've got neurodivergent people in your workplace, in your workforce. Um, and I, I struggled with, knowing I was different, but not knowing uh, what it was that make me, made me different because I didn't have that diagnosis. I felt myself struggling to do things that other people weren't struggling with. And I didn't know why things that were perceived as simple tasks were so hard for me. Growing up and attending school and then eventually entering the workforce as an undiagnosed neurodivergent adult meant I had to make my own way in the world. And when traditional avenues were closed off to, to me, 
I had to find alternate routes to get in, alternate ways around. And sometimes the ways that I had to take were going to be the long way and things would take me longer to sort out, but I did keep myself moving forward. And neurodiversity gave me a new way at looking at myself and my relation to the world and other people in it. I am no longer operating from a place of shame. And now that I know the truth, I've been working to unlearn old, unhealthy habits and live life more authentically, a more neurodivergent lifestyle. And I've even changed the way I show up in the workplace because of the new information. So neurodiversity, I like to say, is the next frontier in human diversity right now. Uh, when we're looking at organizations and companies, uh, talking about just stat status statistics about diversity in general, companies that have more diverse management teams have 19% higher revenue. Inclusive companies are also 1.7 times more likely to be innovative leaders in their market. And diverse teams outperform individual decision makers up to 87% of the time when it comes to making business decisions. So diversity is good for business. And neurodiversity is literally diverse thinkers, diverse brains, diverse minds with diverse strengths and weaknesses. So when we're looking at all of this, you know, diverse kinds of decision makers, um, neurodiversity really fits beautifully into diversity. And unfortunately, it's often this ignored piece of DNI initiatives. And, and I'm telling businesses right now, it's like if your neurodiverse or if your diversity and inclusion initiative doesn't include neurodiversity it's already obsolete at this point right now. Uh, and you've probably already got neurodivergent people in your workspace, again, I'm telling you. Um, and neurodivergent people, you know, we're often great, loyal and hardworking employees. And we bring along those fresh perspectives and valuable skills, but a lot of us are gonna find navigating the workspace to be a challenge. And many neurodivergent people, unfortunately, find themselves underemployed if we are lucky enough to find ourselves employed at all. And those of us who are squeezed out of these systems that have been set up by inflexible employers may even move on to freelance work as I have done. Uh, and that's so that we can set up our own systems that work for us. And when I was growing up, I had no explanation for why my strengths and weaknesses were often so drastic when compared to my peers. And I had nothing to disclose, no, um, no help either. And moving into the workplace, I was still undiscovered. It is important for people with neurological differences or any disability to be able to speak up and not be ashamed when asking for help. Not knowing or that my brain worked differently meant I wasn't asking for help back then. And unfortunately, I've also worked in these office cultures where being able to take abuse was thought of as a good thing and it was championed. We would, they would see who could work the most hours without rest, week after week, back to back, and people were praised for being willing to neglect their families and their self-care. And the other thing in this kind of a culture that was valued was having this ability to hide or overcome all of your weaknesses. And for a while, I just thought this is what people did to be successful in business. And I tried so hard to keep that pace, hiding my struggles and weaknesses behind a false wall of strength. And what I know now that I didn't know then is that strengths and weaknesses are not inherently good or bad. They are simply part of the human experience. Everybody has strengths, everybody has weaknesses, and everybody's strengths and weaknesses are different. And this is something I have had to learn, and it's actually part of neurodiversity that drew me in the most. As humans, our strengths and weaknesses are different, and it doesn't matter, for example, if I'm bad at proofreading or some other 
random skill that most people are good at because these skills are common enough amongst humanity that somebody else has those skills. Diversity is beautiful. Neurodiversity is beautiful. We literally think differently. It shouldn't matter if my personal profile of strengths and weaknesses are different. In fact, in business, this can be and often is of benefit because I have skills and strengths that are less common amongst the general population as well. We live in this world where being able to put on a brave face is cherished and often praised. And this makes asking for help even more difficult for those of us who need it from time to time, especially if we're asking for help with things that other people around us don't need help with. In one of the best organizational cultures I have ever been a part of, we had this value of vulnerability-based trust. We did focus on our skills and we put people in positions to do things that they enjoyed and were good at, but we were also very honest and upfront with our weaknesses and our struggles. And this meant members of our team were empowered and encouraged to speak up, even when they were having difficulty, instead of hiding those weaknesses. This meant we were honest about them and were able to gain help from each other when we needed it. And as a team, we realized that our weaknesses weren't shameful and they were an opportunity for us to work together on common workplace issues. People were able to ask for help and speak up for their needs, helping everyone show up feeling supported and ready to do their best work. Our varied sets of perspectives, skills, and abilities often sparked creativity and out of the box problem, uh, out of the box solutions to the problems that we were working on to solve for our clients and internal team problems. And what we found in this more supportive and empowered work environment, uh, and what I also learned uh, is that my neurodivergence really does influence my strengths, but I needed to be empowered and properly equipped by my employer. And so I had to have the obstacles removed so that I could be the most effective employee I could be. And, um, you know, we talk about, you know, I found out I was autistic late in life. And this is, I was not in a good place when I found out I was autistic. And this is part of why I found out I was autistic, actually, is because I was not in a good place. Uh, but that knowledge that I did find uh, th that I was neurodivergent back then is something that has really changed my life. And it is something that helped me pivot and get my life back on track and allowed me to learn how to live my most authentic life as my most authentic self as an autistic person. And since discovering this neurodivergence a little over four years ago, I have learned something that I, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I could have known all along. And that's that I can only be truly happy and successful if I am able to be my most authentic self permitted to exist and be comfortable in my own skin. And I'm actually sure that is probably the case for all of you here, if you really think about it here, because people need to be accepted as we are. That is the whole person, the strengths, the weaknesses, we need to be accepted. It's, it's something that we as humans need, but unfortunately, not all neurodivergent people have. We're often asked to change. And hiding my weaknesses and my struggles was preventing me from moving forward in life and getting help when I needed it. In my 30s, I had to teach myself to ask for help because I learned to mask those weaknesses instead of speaking up. Neurodivergence is invisible. And if I didn't want you to know that I was neurodivergent, you would never know. Neurodivergent masking is when a neurodivergent person either consciously or subconsciously hides or masks their neurodivergent traits in order to blend in or appear neurotypical. 
And it's important to note that when a neurodivergent person is masking, it is not something that is done to be manipulative or deceptive. It is something that is done in self-defense and is often the result of bullying or being picked on. And over the years, I learned to compensate or mask, hide my struggles and differences, but not all neurodivergent people can hide their struggles. And for those of us who do mask, uh, this ability to camouflage can be something that fluctuates throughout a person's lifetime. Uh, for, in fact, when I am not doing well, my ability to mask or hide my struggles is diminished and my areas of weakness do become more pronounced. And I may regress as it's sometimes I hear it's called in children uh, or I say burn out. Uh, and my, and that's, you know, when that happens, my ability to function, and this is air quotes here, function as expected in neurotypical society is decreased. And masking is hard on neurodivergent people for many reasons, other than the very obvious uh, problem that having to hide your authentic self would cause any human being because we need to be a authentic uh, as humans, um, but masking autistic people specifically has been tied to having poor mental health impacts such as increased anxiety and increased depression. And this is particularly alarming considering that so many autistic people have co-occurring mental health conditions such as anxiety or depression, diagnosable co-occurring mental health conditions. And unfortunately, suicide is still one of the top killers of autistic people. And we're masking and we're burning ourselves out. And some autistic people, we have this talent for pushing ourselves past where we should push ourselves because we've been holding ourselves to those neurotypical standards. And I, I speak from experience here as one of those autistic people, uh, having repeatedly, repeatedly experienced autistic burnout in my life. And autistic burnout, if this is a new term to you, is, is defined, and this is not my definition, as the intense physical, mental, or emotional exhaustion that is often accompanied by a loss of skills that some autistic people experience. And many autistic people say that this results mainly from the cumulative effects of having to navigate a world that has been designed for neurotypical people. And these burnouts with autistic people are gonna often be caused by stressors in the autistic person's environment. And with autistic people specifically often will include sensory distress and other sensory related triggers. So that's one way that this can vary from burnout in the general population because people can get all kinds of burnout. You know, even neurotypical people burn out, they get workplace burnout, there's parenting burnout. There's all these different kinds of burnout that exist, just getting burnt out. But autistic burnout specifically, we're talking about um, sensory triggers and the sensory world is something that is often a big consideration we have to take. And autistic burnout is often very common in workplaces, especially if neurotypical people are setting the pace and autistic people are expected to keep up with the neurotypical pace in that system or in schools as well, because I've burned out in school when I was a young person. And like I said, I've hit this burnout phase multiple times in my life and the first time that I can clearly remember it, although it may not have been actually the first time it ever happened to me, it was when I was only 11. And then again, it happened in my teens and again in the workplace leading to my late autism discovery at 29. And I was up until that point in this endless cycle of burning myself out because I didn't understand that my pace could and should be different from the pace of people around me. I didn't understand my differences or even how I should speak up for my needs. And now that I know I'm neurodivergent, I've been learning what I need and how my mind works and now learning ways to work with my mind instead of against it because I'd really been working against myself in many ways for a lot of years. And learning to have pride in myself has been a very important piece and that's because I had to overcome a lot of shame that had been keeping me down for a lot of years, thinking I was this broken person that wasn't good enough. And you know, I was a broken 
failure of a neurotypical uh, and then realizing, oh, you're not a broken neurotypical, you're, 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 you're an autistic person. It's my own little uh, ugly duckling story, I feel. Um, I briefly mentioned earlier that there are obstacles that a lot of neurodivergent people can face when entering the workforce. Uh, and so in order to successfully employ neurodivergent people and prevent workplace burnout, uh, it, with people who have invisible differences, it is important to talk about some of those obstacles. For example, it might be someone's first job search and maybe they don't know where to start or they may have applied for many jobs already and they've been unable to land anything stable despite putting in their best efforts. And if you are not getting callbacks and you're being told no over and over again, uh, it, it, it's, it's disheartening. And and, you know, the other thing, too, is like if it's new and you're in your new job search, you not you might not know where to start with all of that. The resumes, cover letters, interviews, emails, callbacks. This is a lot of uncertainty for people who may often have um, anxiety around new situations and change. And for many neurodivergent people, autistic people especially, change can be hard. And settling into a new setting, such as a new job or career, is going to be a struggle for most people, actually. It's, it's a hard thing to do. But for autistic people who often have a, I say, diagnosable di difficulty in dealing with change, and I'm going to read from this medical diagnostic criteria, and then I promise I'll give you a human spin on this uh, afterwards because I, I can't throw that medical language out there without humanizing it because uh, it's just so one-sided um, but the medical books define this as insistence on sameness and flexible adherence to routines or ritualized patterns of behavior extreme distress at small changes difficulties with transitions rigid thinking patterns example need to take same route or eat same foods every day yeah Okay, so let's humanize that a little bit. So to me, as an autistic person, sameness often just makes sense. Um, I'm gonna find the most efficient, effective way to do something and I'm gonna stick to it. And it also gives me a little bit more predictability. I don't mind predictability. I like it and I thrive in it. And you know, every autistic person is different, but that's just for me. Um, and I, I like to do things the logical way of do things. Um, and then, in addition to it just being a logical way of doing things, having that sameness for me has, is a way that I often can create calmness in my world. You think as autistic people, we are in this neurotypical world and it's been set up by neurotypicals and it's often very chaotic and very stressful. And so we need some calm in all of that. And having a routine, knowing what's coming next, knowing, you know, what, what's, it just lets us relax and be able to kind of just go with it because we know what's happening next. It's just easier. And, you know, though autistic people, we can change our routines, doing so is hard on us and it can take us longer to acclimate to new situations or new habits. But I found that often once I do learn good, healthy, healthy work habits, I, I can maintain them because it becomes a habit. It becomes the new routine. And I have a, that really big desire for stability. And so I'll, I'll cling to it once it becomes habit. Uh, but getting into the new swing of a new habit is sometimes a little bit difficult. Uh, but even that, you know, starting a new job is still one of the most stressful things that ever happens um, in my life. And I am speaking as an experienced employee with many different jobs under my belt from car hop to VP of marketing and organizational change, organizational change agent, excuse me, it's a lot to spit out. <laughs> and now, you know, just a business owner as well, full-time business owner. Uh, and so it can take me months to feel settled into a new role, even within the same company. And it's actually taken me about six months to begin to feel settled into my current role and a change in my own company. And I have a lot of control over that change. It's still taking me six months to feel like, okay, I, I got this now, I'm good, I, I'm, I'm okay. 
And if another change happens, it'll take me another six months to get used to it. So I'm hoping there's not any changes soon because it, it does take me a while to ramp up to a change. But once I'm settled, I'm in my lane, I'm good to go. Um, and so with employers, they may need help you know, to guide and support neurodivergent hires through these onboarding times and these transition periods if maybe they're getting a promotion or moving into a new role. And I, I'm trying to remind managers to, to have grace during times of transition. Uh, and you know, sometimes well-meaning employers also need to be uh, reminded uh, or to look at policies and procedures because sometimes practices uh, can cause unintentional harm to people who have invisible differences like neurodivergence. Uh, and so on this, uh, this next one, we're talking about um, some of their accommodations that um, would be necessary in order to um, support neurodivergent people because our differences are invisible and can vary greatly from person to person. When you are looking at accommodating people in the workplace, it is really important that you start with a very individualized approach. Uh, and so the first thing that for me has to be a consideration uh, with autistic people is the sensory processing environment. Uh, and this is also something for people with ADHD because certain things can be distracting within the sensory environment. And as an autistic adhd -er, the sensory environment uh, is something that has to be tackled for me to come work in an office. But number one accommodation for me on that has been working remotely so that I just can control my space. Uh, unfortunately, not all jobs can be done remotely. And so if you have employees that you need to come into a physical space, you may have to modify your physical space. So maybe that is changing lighting or letting employees change the lighting in their space. You can have specific quiet workplaces. People can go work in when they need quiet. And your neurotypical people will love this too. Like I'm on a deadline, I need to focus. Let me go work in the quiet area for a while. It's these things don't just benefit neurodivergent people, but a lot of these things are great for everybody. Uh, other things you can do is have provide uh, or allow people to have noise canceling headphones. There are environmental sound machines. Uh, also be mindful of bathrooms and kitchens that can have smells that can creep into your work area. Uh, and then standing desks are really great or chairs that allow for movement while people are sitting still. Uh, and Flexible schedules are really good too, if possible. Not all jobs can work around a flexible schedule. And so if you can't have a flexible schedule, it's important to let people, especially if they have sensory differences, to have dedicated break or quiet time where they can get away and kind of take a break from the sensory environment and get out of that for a while. And so letting them know when they will be able to have those dedicated breaks and making sure you don't cancel the person's breaks because they really do need the sensory break. Um, and other things to consider for neurodivergent people are gonna be cognitive and organizational tools such as calendars, organizers, planners, timers, smartwatches, those kinds of things. Uh, and you know, I, I'm one of those neurodivergent people who struggle with time management and executive functioning, uh, you know, autism, ADHD, uh, and the visual, you know, I, I use my visual schedule, I need it, uh, and I, I, I really use my reminders and they, they keep me on track. And um, even your employees, like I said, who are not neurodivergent can use these things and benefit from them. So I, it's great to just provide them to everyone in your workplace if they would like to use them and make sure it's, you know, Standard practice, it's not a shame. Anyone can use these tools. Um, and you know, when we're looking at workplace communication, this is often something too that is a big uh, struggle for neurodivergent people, but uh, that you can fix that will help everyone in your workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, most people are gonna benefit from clear directions and clear instructions. Uh, but this is something I as an autistic person really, really need. Uh, and I, I like to get clear written instructions uh, or to ask, hey, can I take some time to take a note? Uh, my friend who is autistic and dyslexic doesn't want things in writing and doesn't want a bunch of text. They use like an audio recorder and they get voice memos and voice notes and text to speech tools and things like that because text is hard for them. Uh, so you really, do, like I said, we're looking at the individual here, but allowing people in your workspace to use whatever tools to communicate, help them communicate the best and to take 
um, information in. Uh, and also you think about using captioning and transcriptioning services for your meetings for people who have auditory processing difficulties or uh, have are hard of hearing. Um, and, you know, all of these things uh, are going to also impact the way you onboard tra and train your new hires. You know, think about if someone is going to need additional training and onboarding time to learn their new skills. Uh, is the person training your new hire someone who is good at adapting their training style to how someone learns? Because within your workplace, you're going to have people who learn differently. And you know, is as a new hire coming on. Is it someone, would they benefit from having a mentor? Because we talked about earlier that onboarding period being a difficult period for any new hire. A lot of new hires would appreciate having a dedicated mentor, whether they're all neurodivergent, autistic or not, or a job coach is also another accommodation that can be a great accommodation that most people, if you ask, would say, I would love to have a job coach. Yes, give me a job coach. So these, these things that are, are really beneficial for neurodivergent people often are good for everyone um and, and just remember you know we're looking at this onboarding time that that new job is the start of a new journey and it can be a very scary process for anyone due to all of the uncertainty and there are lots of considerations that need to be made at that crucial starting phase as what the appropriate tools for success could look like for the individual. Um, and, you know, back when I was diagnosed, if we keep saying going back then four and a half years ago, I had a lot of work to do and I had to totally change the way I thought about myself and my relation to the wider world. And I know, unfortunately, and it breaks my heart that so many neurodivergent people are still in that mental space that I was living in at that time uh, where they may have adapted just these self-limiting ideas about what they can't do. And I spent a large portion of my life not believing in myself. And when I didn't have faith in my ability to do things and I was only focused on the things I couldn't do, I was trapped and I was unable to move forward in my life. And I, you know, this, this retraining of my brain from thinking about all of the reasons I shouldn't try and being afraid of failure to this current mindset of, okay, I just gotta try, I've just gotta jump, even when it's scary, has taken me years um, to just focus that shift of, from the possibilities of success uh, being my motivator instead of thinking about all of the things that could go wrong. Um, and trying, even if even if success is a long shot, just trying anyway. Uh, and you know, I've I've done this transition over the years, and I've gone, you know, just using myself as an example, and I'm thriving now. But that is only because I am fully accommodated mentally, physically, uh, intellectually, and sensory wise for the first time in my life. For the first time in my life, I have all of my needs met. And these are needs I didn't even know I had for the first 29 years of my life. And I was diagnosed because these needs weren't being met. And I was diagnosed because I was struggling. And the supports and accommodations, whatever we call them, allow me to perform at the same level as everyone else so that I may operate within the systems that weren't set up with my needs in mind. And they level the playing field in this neurotypical game. And for many neurodivergent people, being fully supported can be the difference between simply surviving or thriving in life. <laughs> and normally I would have an end slide so you would know that was the end. <laughs> I'll just come back instead. <laughs> it's a lot of my face. <laughs> I usually, if, I, if I'm not clear that it's the end, I literally just go, the end. <laughs> the end. Some fantastic comments and questions going on. Um, I think I'll, I'll keep, because there's another one I think for me to pull out. So David, um, are you right if I hand it over to you for the moment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a couple of questions. Um, you'll have to forgive me if it's kind of revisiting, because as I was typing questions, you were kind of answering them immediately. <laughs> Um, oh, no, so if we're good. revisiting some stuff you'll have to forgive me but um, I was thinking about what you were saying about at the beginning about how 
your school approached your guardians and they approached it with this whole idea of, you know, we think there's something wrong. Um, mm. And I was really interested what your thoughts might be about how institutions such as schools and workplaces could broach the topic of neurodiversity with the people that they suspect may be neurodivergence. You know, if a school suspects a student is neurodivergent, how, how could they broach that topic, you know, respectfully with, with the guardians of that child? Or how can a workplace approach an employee and say, have you considered that you might be autistic or ADHD or both or, or you know, any you know, you know, combination of neurodivergency? Yeah, well, when, when I talk about myself now, and especially talking about reflecting back on myself as a young person in the education system, I like to say that we didn't know back then that I was a young person who learned and experienced the word, world differently and needed to figure out how I learned in order to have teachers modify the way they were teaching so that they could teach the way I learned because the way they were teaching in the classroom was set up to people that they assumed at the time was the majority. But really, I think the other thing that we need to do with this is similar, you know, and I'm not an expert in children, so I wanna just disclose that, but similar to in workplace systems, working with adults, where these things are standardized, where they need to look at every child to see how they learn, not just the ones they think are neurodivergent, because, this neurodivergence is invisible. You don't know how a child learns unless you look at that and evaluate that. So why aren't we looking at every kid when they're entering school to find out how they best can learn and find out how they can show up and do their best work at school and teaching them all the way they learn? And why are we waiting to figure this out when they're struggling? Because it's only usually picked up when we are struggling. We're like, oh, this kid is struggling. Let's look at the kid. And then it's like, when we're doing it that way, we're saying this kid is struggling and it's this kid is a problem this kid isn't fitting into the system you see it's like the whole system the way we have it set up is like only looking at kids when they struggle and it's like oh you're struggling to fit into the system like to learn the way we're teaching in the classroom instead of just saying we need to look at how all these kids learn and teach them how they learn so it's less about <laughs> saying this child doesn't fit into the system and more about saying how do all of these children work in this system and how can we best support everyone you know not just coming forward to parents saying we think your child's autistic but saying okay uh, all of these children have different learning styles how can we accommodate as best we can all these different learning styles yeah yeah because you know I, I was autistic even before we knew I was autistic right you know the diagnosis doesn't matter as much as getting the kid accommodated so they can succeed you know what what are the right tools that's what matters what tools can we get these kids to help them succeed in the workplace and, and look at how they process information are they you know visual processors or are they people who struggle with you know like are, are there you know how, how are they how are they taking things in um because this isn't just an issue that it's, it's like neurodiversity is includes the you know the neurotypical if, if ter typical exists really or if that's a myth I don't know you know we'll see right if there if there is such thing as typical someday um, but you know neurodiversity includes everybody neurodivergent neurotypical and everybody and we all learn different we all have different strengths we all have different weaknesses and so it's like the knowledge that none of us experience the world the same way and not any one of those is a wrong or bad way to experience it it's just a different experience of life and the world and processing information and how we you know how we learn and, and i think that. people you know teachers and so on they really struggle with the idea of giving all the children the same or, or not the same because like i say the whole point is actually that they're not all the same but in the sense of I did mm -hmm. some training yesterday and there was they were lovely. They were all really, really lovely. And one person's question was, what can I do when I've got this one student who, you know, is allowed their, um, you know, they're given their uh, STEM cube and it's really frustrating for the rest of the children. And I was like, well, one, why don't you try it? and realize how fun it is. And then you actually realize why, what it is they like about it. Um, but also too, why don't you give all the children something, you know, that's 
to, mm-hmm. to fiddle with all that kind of thing and she was like oh you know just think you know it's just why do we have to highlight the children that are neurodivergent and then mm-hmm. they get picked on the other children might if this is mainstream schools obviously but um you know and then they get picked on and and highlighted for being different and not necessarily in a positive way why not do it across mm-hmm. the board yeah and that's that's what I think real neuro systems that take neurodiversity into account like truly neurodiverse friendly systems are just going to be tr- inclusive because we're looking at right now if I look at the way systems are set up often especially in workplaces and this is what I'm trying to change but you know it was a first step so it's better than nothing I guess but we have separate systems. It's segregated, we're segregated. We have to go through separate employment pipelines and separate, you know, like separate classrooms and, you know, separate systems. It's like, I wanna be included. I don't wanna be separated and segregated out and pushed off to the side to go through a different system. I wanna go through the same doors that everybody else is going through, you know? I don't wanna have to be separate. I want, that's not inclusion. That's and I, I, said, I think I said this, I think it was on a session I did with um, Bobby Ellman. It was, it was for Bobby. Um, and I think that's where I was talking about how sad it is though, if we do do that, if we do remove all the beautiful neurodivergent and disabled children, for instance, and adults, if we do have them separate, they go to separate schools and things instead of actually making it possible for them to be encouraged and embraced in, a, I don't want to call it a mainstream setting, but a setting where they're all, all those children are, are there because you're also taking away those opportunities for the non-disabled children to meet and understand difference and meet um, just beautiful other human beings. It's just a very bizarre, you're just, you're just creating, a, you know, peddling out more factories for um, more ableist adults, really. If you don't and get this is the whole them. point of the social model of disability, isn't it? Is that when we adapt society to fit everyone, we, we reduce the way a disability impedes someone. You know, when we, yeah. you know, and it makes life more comfortable for everyone, you know, not just the marginalized communities. When society adapts to fit everyone, it makes the world better for everyone. Mm-hmm. It yeah. really does. And sorry, sorry, go, go, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say it, it, it really does. And, and that's what I say, like a lot of the things in the workplace is like I, I had, when I was asking for accommodations in the workplace before, uh, once upon a time when I, I was newly discovered, I asked for things and the employer was literally like, well, everyone would like to have that. So it's not fair to give it to you. And it's like, but that's literally the point. If everyone would like to have what I'm asking, then maybe your system is broken and you should fix it and give everyone what what I'm asking for then and make it available to everyone and and not and say we can't give you special treatment you know (laughs) and a lot of the things as well they don't even have to be expensive this is the thing that 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 people assume that it's going to be really expensive um I'm quite aware that we had quite a number of comments which I've, I've pulled out of the comment section so David did you have any other I had one more question um you mentioned, uh, you know, you, you, you broached the topic of how a lot of autistic people are either underemployed or unemployed. Um, you know, it, it's a difficult system to get into employment. I was really wondering, what advice do you have for autistic people that are struggling to find their place in the world of work? You know, it, it, it's don't, don't only go through the traditional avenues of submitting applications and things like that a lot of the best jobs I've ever gotten were because I knew someone who got me in uh and you you like use the connection like you know my first my very first job outside of the family business was uh, a job in fast food the the roller skating car hop thing And, and I already knew people who worked there so they vouched for me and got me in and then you know I uh, and I've also used temp agencies before, like d- try different ways. Don't, don't try only one way to get into a job just because the, the, the job, just submitting an application isn't always 
the best. And especially submitting online applications where they don't see your face and it's just a paper, you're less human to them that way versus like going in in person and like handing something over where they actually get to see you. Um, but when you're when you're in the interview, you know, really think about before you go in that they they want to know about your values and what makes you a good employee. And for some autistic people, it can be really hard for us to brag on ourselves, but you have to get used to it. If you're, if, as long as they're looking for interview settings, I like work trials so much better in interviews, uh, but you know, you, you've got to go prepared to say what it is that you think you can do for this business and what you bring to the table. Uh, and know, you know, why you want to work there and, you know, really think about those things really carefully because those are questions that are going to, they're kind of be trying to get out of you every interview you go to. Uh, so, so be prepared for those. And really also the other thing that's really important to know is because we often take things really literally. So if we're looking at um, job posts, like descriptions online, and it says, we're looking for someone with these qualifications. Even if you don't have all of the qualifications, but you think you can do the job and maybe you're only missing like one or two of those qualifications, or you just, you know, you can do this job, apply anyway. Even if you don't meet all of the qualifications, still apply because I've gotten jobs I was underqualified for because I said, look, you, you want me to know this, this, and this. I don't know it yet, but I promise you, if you give me three months or six weeks, I will learn this skill and I'll have it. And so then it's like, oh, okay, well, we'll we put this in your contract then. It's like, okay, you didn't have the skill that we wanted, but we're giving you this much ramp up time to get up to speed to where you wanted. So there are options that employers aren't necessarily gonna disclose up front that are out there. Um, and with the, with the employee, the, 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 the process where you're going through interviews, I hate that it's like this and I'm begging employers to change, but the way it is, it's kind of the interviewer against the interviewee and they're trying to get information out of you. And it, it's horrible. I wish it, it should, it should be the, when you, I try to think of it when I go into an interview for a job that I am interviewing the employer as much as they are interviewing me. Because I want to know about if they are going to be a company that's going to treat me right and they're going to respect me. Uh, if they have a problem with queer people or they aren't neurodiversity friendly, that's going to be an issue. It's not going to work for me. I'm not going to be able to be there. So like, I need to know if it's a good enough space for me. Uh, if they're going to be willing to accommodate me, it, I don't want to work there if they're not. Uh, they, you know, legally, it says they have to, but it's really hard to push that right now because our differences are invisible. So it's easy for people to dismiss them. Uh, that's going to get harder as I think employees and businesses are going to start to get sued for not accommodating people with invisible differences and they're going to have to get in line. Um, it, it, it's inevitable. I'm starting to see a few cases that have come up um, in America here. Uh, so, you know, it's only a matter of time before this becomes like urgent issue or HR people are like, oh no, it's too late. Um, and this is but, the frustrating. You know, we've got to look at it. This is the frustrating <laughs> thing as well is so big, so in my school of psychology at the university um you know there's quite a number of researchers who look at organizations organizational psychology and hiring um how good hiring is so um you know the fact that actually a lot of the time those interview processes because they do only favor really somebody who can sell themselves and, mm -hmm. and then actually looking later down the line, a few, you know, a few months later down the line, that actually that wasn't the right employee. So that happens too often because those interview oh, situations yeah. are so flawed. And so I've got, you know, I've got colleagues who their their research is based around um, people not hiring the right people kind of thing, you know. So mm -hmm. um, and then like, so like you said about us not being able to sell ourselves, I can't do that. It's awful. It's just not something yeah. I can do. I'd rather, although I'd rather just say, look, it's on my CV. That's my selling myself. Can we now just talk about how I actually do the job? Um, and I think potentially it kind of all links into a question um, and a comment that I've got. One question sort of from um, 
one of the learners and then a comment that I made as well. Um, so the person, Victoria, asked, Lyric, I didn't know I was autistic when I um, burnt out from the workplace three years ago. I haven't been able to return to the workplace. My real friends, they put in quotation marks, tell me I work very hard as I've been in school for my passion as a musician, but I tend to think of myself as unemployed and not capable of work. I feel like being an artist is the only line of work I can channel my true authenticity into as an autistic person, but I don't know where to go for help with self-employment. Do you have advice for late diagnosed autistic freelancers? And the reason I say that's kind of linked is because I'll come back to it to, to make the point again so we can actually answer it. Because I made a point when you were talking, a comment, which was, what do you think about the fact that some of us end up making our own employment paths as we cannot fit in the systems that are in place or even get past the interview stage? I can't imagine having a proper job. Um, I just keep making my own roles um, because I don't interview well at all. So that person's last comment was or question. Do you have advice for late diagnosed autistic freelancers? Yeah. So, the, the, you know, the, the best advice I would say is I, I'm lucky that I learned business basics starting when I worked in the family business with my mom. My mom has a hair salon. So if that makes a little sense. Uh, so I grew up in the family business and she taught me like all of the things like the banking and how she paid invoices and those basic things about running a business that you need to know. And then when I worked in fast food management and I managed retail, I did, I did more of those skills and enforce those skills. So if you are going to start your own business, I think, I think it can be a great thing. And you can you know, start really small and slowly and not necessarily invest a lot to get going. Um, depending on what you're doing, you may need some business insurance, depending on what it is, you know, like the consulting, I need insurance to do that. Um, but arts and crafts and music, you can get, you know, if, if, if you have your instruments and your stuff ready to go, that, that's a great thing to just go with. Uh, but you will want to know at least some business, business ba basics about, you know, how to do your accounting, um, and then think about like saving up for if you're not, not someone who's great with money, if you need to hire someone to do that piece of the accounting or the bookkeeping or your taxes or what, you know, what can you do? But there are really easy like business basics classes you can take now on even probably YouTube for free. There's things like Udeme and, uh, you know, things that sometimes they'll have sales. Like I just watch for the sales on those educational courses because they'll be like $9.99 for a $200 course if you wait, you know, when you just wait for them to go on sale. And just to learn the basics of how to run a business because, so many, whether they're neurodivergent or not, business uh, people get into business because they're really passionate about something and they're good at their thing, their niche, whatever their niche is. Um, and they don't know a bit about, you know, the different aspects of business from, the, you know, it's more than just the banking and the accounting. There's also, you know, the marketing piece and other things you have to take into consideration. Uh, and just having a bit of knowledge around those things because I, I got those that knowledge hands-on um, but you don't have to go that route and learn all of that hands-on then go 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 find a course and just learn some of that or study some of that on your own you know read books or whatever, whatever your 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 way of learning is but definitely learn learn that piece uh, if that's not something you've already got uh, in, in your in your wheelhouse and then think about realistically like there are certain pieces, you know, of the business that I don't necessarily want to touch. And it's like, okay, those things are things I know that I have to budget for to get help with because that's outside of my wheelhouse. And that's going to be different for every person depending on what their in, in special skill sets are. So it's like, okay, realistically, these are certain things I'm going to need help. And it's okay to need help. You know, we all need help with different things. <laughs> so yeah, does that help at all? Yeah, that's actually, I think that's, actually quite good advice um there may dependent on where you are in the world maybe even you know in the UK there may be free courses that are run by certain um you know our employment centers and things like that oh yeah so right. I'm not too sure so if anyone in the comment section knows about the UK specifically but obviously any other um countries that might have initiatives I think that's actually quite a good advice look for those business courses even if they're quite you know short ones um yeah just so you have an idea of you know how to how to steer the ship yeah 
um so this one from terry was i think what here they were trying to do was trying to sort of highlight what you talked about to make sure they were understanding so they said uh, doing my best to follow the quick verbals so i think they meant in terms of the quick talking through all the things so they said is this highlighting pre pretty accurate so they're just I think trying to get a, a grasp of what you were talking about to help make the workplace more neurodivergent you've been focusing on the increased financial advantages of facilitating neurodivergence and on improving understanding of neurodivergence is that basically correct that's what they're asking well the thing is until I started to explain to businesses why this matters because unfortunately a lot of businesses are looking at the bottom dollar like why do I have to do this because you, you look at businesses not all of them are going to do this because it's the right thing to do I wish so you have to say look this is something you can't ignore and it's of benefit to you to look at it now because people and you should think oh, well I don't want to find money to make change or to look at policies or to change things because either way you've got to put people on it and it takes time and energy and maybe if they don't have to you know if they just start looking at it internally and even if they had like a neurodivergent person on their team do this and they didn't bring in like an external consultant they would still have to pay that person the hours to do the work and rewrite their handbooks and things like that to to do education so you know it it's like why should i invest my time or my employees time or potentially company money in doing this if you know i don't understand why it's beneficial to my organization so you have to explain to organizations at least some reason it's beneficial to them other than yeah it's it's, it's the right thing to do uh and until i had more concrete things to share with businesses they weren't really wanting to just do it because it was the responsible thing I, I hate that um and then what was the second point that they said it was uh the second bullet point on that chloe it was sorry because i've crossed it through uh da, 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 da. you've been focusing on the increased financial advantages and on improving understanding so i think you've kind of understanding yeah understanding is the first piece uh, and that's why, because if people understand, like right now, when you go into a workplace, a lot of times they don't understand there's a problem and you tell them a problem and they still don't understand why until you explain to them the problem in detail enough for them to have enough understanding of the problem to want to fix it. So this is, you know, education is a first step. Uh, and so you go in and you start saying, okay, here's a problem. Here's some things you can start doing to fix it. And they'll start doing the things that, you know, I, we talk about some of the most simple, basic, most affordable things they can do now and walk away. You know, usually when I spend with businesses, we'll spend about an hour together and, um, it's a bit longer than, you know, this format today. And then we'll have some time to talk after as well. Uh, and it's like an hour's worth of actionable things they can go start doing right away that aren't going to cost them a lot more money necessarily to fix. Uh, and then, you know, later, if they wanted to come look at actually rewriting their handbook and their policies and, you know, changing, you know, certain things in their uh, organization, we, we could move on to that step as well if they need help with that too. Uh, but education is just such a first piece because otherwise, like as most people think, oh, wow, okay, I see how this is actually harmful. You can't just say, oh, this is harmful, you need to fix it. And they go, I don't understand. No, everything's fine. Our company works fine. We don't need to change. It's working like a well-oiled machine. Why should we change it? And so you have to like really break down that and shake them up and go, this is why you need to change. And then they go, okay. And then they, they then they go on. But a lot of times it's like that first piece. <laughs> well, and I remember, again, it was, it was a, a, um, a colleague from actually another university and they were talking about looking at, processes and ways of reducing largely stigma around any stigmatized identity in employment settings and they were showing me this model you know like a diagram of what they thought needed to be done and I said sadly you've missed out a really key point which is how does it benefit the employer we shouldn't we would want them to be humane and human but sadly, it does have to be at this point in time for most employers, not all, there will be some lovely people out there, but it has to be oh, a, there are some good ones. what benefit is it for me kind of thing. Um, so try yep. to sell that a bit. Yeah. I have a whole rant. And that's how it is in the job interview too. You know, the interviewer wants, the, hire, the, the employer wants to know, what can you do for me if I hire you? I mean, that's how business is right now. I hate it, but that's where we are. I have a whole rant, ahead, to be David. honest. Uh, I won't get into it now, but there, there's a whole rant that, that I've been meaning to write about, about the fact that 
our very capitalist society it's very much about well you know how are you going to increase productivity what are you going to do to bring in the profit for our company and i find that very very frustrating because sometimes i do feel well i think we all know that profits are often valued over people and uh, happy a lot. people are more productive anyway yeah you know like seriously happy people are more productive yeah <laughs> they are they are <laughs> But yeah, there's a whole rant there. I won't get into it now because we'd have to do a whole other live stream for that. But. I could hear, I could listen to you rant about it. I, I'm down. There, there, we got, we got to fix these systems. Yeah, you know? we've got some revamping to do. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Ian asked. Uh, I'm terrified of going back to the office. They've kicked me out of my own small office to a huge open plan space full of people, light, noise, and everything. Do you have advice for how to disclose to your employer? And do you have advice for asking for accommodations? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, that is a nightmare. Wow. Yeah. So um and, and I want to preface this by saying that disclosing in every workplace is going to be different. And there is no one size fits all answer for this because Unfortunately, depending on where you work or your career field, disclosing your neurodivergence may or may not be helpful to you. Um, but I found myself in a place where I needed to disclose because I was not going to be able to continue in the workplace unless I was accommodated. Uh, and then when I would disclose, uh, one of the first times I was disclosing, I was then told that I was not going to be able to be accommodated at all. And then I had to leave that workplace. Uh, so just, you know, it may not work out well. And then there are other situations where, unfortunately, if your employer has just the wrong mindset about people who are asking for help, it may be something where it, it doesn't benefit you. But, you know, I if you have the right workplace and the right employer, because you know, the next job I went to right after that was somewhere where I was openly autistic as I was brought on the team and it wasn't a problem. If you have a supportive environment, disclosing it for me was like unlocking this key to success because it was like, okay, this is what I need to be the best version of myself in this workplace. And so I told, you know, when I was being hired with the, the second employer where I disclosed during the hiring process, I, I came about was like, okay, you know, I, 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 you know, it's like, okay, more of this, this is what I can do for you, but this is what I need because that's, that's the language of business as much as we don't like it. So it was like, I told my employer, you know, as we're hiring, I can do this, this, and this, I, I can work on my own. I don't need you to really guide me very much. I may text or email you if you have a question here or there, but I'm very self-sufficient. Just leave me alone and I work, but I do need to be able to work remotely so that I can control my sensory environment so that I can be focused, not distracted, be efficient and get work done. And then my employer next, next question is, well, what does that look like? Or how do, you, how do we do this? So you know, if you're gonna have to work in the office, you, know, you may, if you don't, depending on your environment and how safe it is to disclose, you may disclose fully and say, I am autistic and I have sensory processing disorder on top of that and that means you know fill in the blank what that means for you and then I need blank what you need in order to continue to be successful uh, but if it's not if you don't feel it's safe to disclose that you are autistic you may disclose uh, that you have sensory processing disorder or, or sensory processing differences and you know you can mention you know what is going to be a problem for you and what you actually need in the workplace so that you can be successful uh, so really think you know about your individual workplace uh, gosh I hope your employer listens to you it's scary every well, time I hear these because I remember like if the employer li doesn't listen like that you know it's like ouch because I, I've been there in that situation where the employer was like sorry we can't give you special treatment and it was like I had the diagnosis and everything and I thought it was just gonna answer all my problems and it was like you know I didn't want to sue my employer and go through you know like I, I didn't want to go through all that and a lot of people don't want to go through all of that you know it's it's a it's a nightmare. It was easier to move on and find another job, you know. They, they've actually, and I could have done that job in my sleep. It could have been. It was an easy job. Um, 
Sorry, Sorry, David, just two seconds. It was um, they replied to say that they've disclosed, but they don't have an official diagnosis. I'm pretty sure because I know this person, they're in the UK and they said that they won't accommodate until they have a diagnosis. I did note that somebody earlier replied to that saying that they thought in the UK that it was required by law for even a suspected disability. So I'm not sure whether they're actually... So Ian, I'm not sure if they're actually legally allowed to demand an official diagnosis. As I understood it, asking for proof of diagnosis was some form of disability discrimination. That's my understanding of it. Um, but I'm not an expert on this, so. Well, yeah. It kind of, that does, because we're talking about the legality now, it kind of links into two more comments. Um, David, was I interrupting you? Were you going to I was just going to say that, you know, Lyric hit the nail on the head when they said that, you know, it's scary because I know that in the UK, especially like whenever I've done a job application form, you get to the bit where they ask you to, you know, if you want to disclose any disabilities and, you know, and how can we make the workspace more accessible? They give you like two lines. like, And it, it just immediately becomes obvious that that this is not something they're too worried about because they've given you the space for about two lines on an A4 sheet to do it to, and especially if you're autistic and you need accommodations, you need more than two lines to talk about what your differences are, why you need accommodating, how you can be accommodated. You know, it, it needs a conversation. It, it needs more than just two lines of writing. And I think that can make it more scary for staff to ask for accommodations because you you've got to you've got to start with uh with an attitude of we have time for this you know mm -hmm. and and i think when you get an application form that provides you with two lines to talk about it it gives you the complete opposite impression I don't think no, they, it shows you're an afterthought and those employers i don't think they really think it through because they must realise, maybe they don't, that so many of us as disabled people, we don't get good job opportunities, if at all. So if they were to yeah. actually give us that good working environment, they would get such a good level of you know, employee. Yes, that will mean no, numerous types of accommodations it really depends on the person so like you said if you've got attention differences or, or struggle with timekeeping and your executive functioning flexible start times if that's possible some people obviously mentioned in sort of mm -hmm. um the service industry that's not possible that kind yeah. of thing but in some places it is you know allowing for those sorts of quite straightforward adjustments you would have yeah. such a loyal employee because we, we can't get those decent jobs in the first place. So they're just sort of missing the whole point. And, and a lot of these things like, oh, it costs almost nothing, you know? And all of a sudden I did see some good changes in the world and the way we work when we all went into lockdown and had to start working remotely. Uh, you know, I had been pushing for work remote jobs uh, since I found out I was autistic and found out how much of an impact the sensory environment had on me. And there was a lot of pushback from employers like we that's just not how we do things around here we don't have people work remote and it's like it's never the way we done we've done things and you know i finally moved to a company and i started as a work trial with them instead of going, well i did we did an interview too but like showing them what i could really do and i started part-time helping on a project and then eventually was hired full-time within like a month or two and then went from marketing manager to VP of marketing and you know to doing all of these things with this company but it was because they could see what I could do even more so than I could tell them and I'm I think I'm good at interviews because I learned how to interview people when I was 17 when I was working in fast food they sent me to like a school to learn how to you know run the store and so you learn how to interview and screen candidates and so that taught me how to reverse engineer it so I knew what to look for so I knew what they were looking for and so I have a peek into that that other people don't understand I've known that since I was 17 uh, but so like having that insight has been really helpful but not all autistic people have that benefit and there was somewhere I was going with this and the ADHD and I just lost it <laughs> <laughs> right well 
if it's all right, I mean, if it comes back, obviously jump in. Um, so that, like I said, there's, yeah. I've got two comments here then. Um, one sounds like I think it's the US and one's from the UK and they're both basically talking about okay. legality. So um, Cynthia asks, is there any way to legally assist people who have been terminated or shut out by employment opportunities? This is a huge struggle where I live and lots of us have problems maintaining employment due to that. So is there a legal assistance to help if people have been terminated or shut out by employment opportunities? Well, I think that's gonna, well, I, I don't know specifically, but I'm sure like, it sounds like legal, like legal assistance, like a legal aid, like I'm sure there are legal aid programs for people who have disabilities in general, because neurodiversity is considered like if you, in the workplace, the only protections we have are through disability protections right now because it's classified as a disability and that's why they can't discriminate against us. So I would assume you would go through the same avenues that we, you would go through uh, to get protection against disability discrimination wherever you are in the world, you know, because it's going to look different. Uh, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to give legal advice, you know, and that, that, that's not my area of expertise is not legal. Um, but there are certain, you know, things that are like, oh, as an HR person, I go, I know, and I go, oh, that's dangerous. No, <laughs> that set off those, those flags as an HR uh, person. Go, no, 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 not okay. <laughs> I mean, we did, we had also on recently, uh, uh, Katrina Stewart, um, who's in, in Scotland, and she has, um, a, a, a sort of peer mentoring program for autistic people to help with employment and things like that um and now i've lost my train of thought as well oh no oh um and we were talking about it's that um it's probably a very good idea and I, I know it's different in the us again but to be part of a union and things like that so regardless of your disability or your need in in you know regards to legality in the employment sector um you know in the uk you can call on your union rep to support you with that legality um issue so if people in the uk i know that's the case i don't know what that's like in the us we don't have a lot of unions in the us unless you're in certain specific industries in certain parts of the country uh in texas where i'm from it's like oh no Texas, Texas is a, is a horrible place to be employed in the, in the ideas that they have, uh, like at will termination, they can fire an employee for without reason. They don't have to give a reason at all for any reason and not disclose that, that to you. It's like they can just let you go. Okay. Yeah. You really can't you, do that in the UK. Yeah. It's actually relatively, <laughs> it's relatively difficult. I say relatively, relatively difficult to fire people in the UK because there are some employment, you know, laws and things like this. Um, but that's not to say that they won't find ways and, and, and so on. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I mean, it, my knowledge of US and unions is based on um, things like uh, Superstore. I don't know if you've seen that series. Yeah, um, I and love that show. <laughs> the, but, so the, so if anyone's not seen it, it's as it sounds. It, it's like um, I kind of like The Office, I guess, but um, in a Superstore, a um, fans club or something. Yeah. yeah, and and there's just a few episodes where they're trying to form a union, and basically the um, the company is trying anything to stop them un un unionizing. Is that the word um yeah. yeah which i don't think we necessarily really get that in the uk you you kind of just get sent details when you start sometimes um i know in in academia you do you get sent here's the union details do you want to sign up okay mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah yeah so that was okay so that was the first one and then i have monique who i'm pretty sure because they're talking about equality act so it must be the uk so first off, they say, can I say Lyric is an awesome name and they love it. Um, they do yeah. workplace training for companies here in the UK. So this is quite useful. Um, they always speak about the Equality Act 2010, sorry, which places a duty on employers here to make reasonable adjustments for disabled staff. But it means that in order for neurodivergent people to have the Equality Act protect their rights, they have to identify as disabled and meet the criteria for disability uh, for it to be considered a protected characteristic. Obviously, the Equality Act does not apply to America. So much question is what, oh, I think that was meant to be. So my question is what legal instruments do you have? So I guess that's kind of, we've kind of answered that yeah. one, but that potentially might help people um, in the UK. And we have similar protections in America, but the thing is, it's like, we haven't seen 
a case. I don't think yet go high enough to have it be enforced to where we feel like employers really know what they have to do and feel like they have to do it and feel like they're going to get in trouble if they don't do it. Does that make sense? Like legally, there are protections for people who are in employment and have disabilities, and we have to be provided reasonable accommodation legally. But if you look at that on the other side, okay, that sounds nice, but a lot of people who have disabilities are underemployed or unemployed, or if they uh, are employed, they don't have a lot of money or financial resources. So if they do lose their job because of being wrongfully terminated, or they have to leave a job because they cannot be accommodated because their employer is like, I'm not doing this for you, I, I, and I don't believe I have to, and you say, yes, you do, it's the law and the employer's like, well, I'm not going to, unless you can hire a lawyer or someone to help you fight that employer or go and go and like go through a process where, you know, if you have a disability, you may not know how to go through this process uh, to, to fight back. A lot of people aren't gonna fight back. They're just gonna be out of work and not have another job, you know, or go look for another job or, you know, they're going to be stuck. And then if it goes bad, you know, you have now got an employer you can't use as a reference. So it, it sounds nice that yes, we have these protections, but right now, uh, because they haven't really been exercised enough for people whose differences are invisible, the way they have been exercised for people whose differences are more obvious. Like, you know, if you go to businesses in America, anything that has public access, it has a wheelchair ramp now. It is wheelchair accessible. There is braille on signs on walls and libraries and things like that. Like there are accessibility there, but those disabilities people are more familiar with. And so people are aware of them and people know they have to accommodate those people. Whereas I was like coming to you telling you I need something and people are like, Psh, I want that too. No. And it's like, cause they don't understand like, no, I, I, you may want this and it may be great for you, but I really need what I'm asking you. And people don't understand that yet about neurodiversity. And I think we have to keep asking for it. I think that's the thing with, oh, yeah. with, with more observable, say, physical disabilities and so on. Um, it's become part of, you know, legal, you know, rights and so on. But I think also the disability movement, you know, it, is it's older than us. Um, so they've been fighting mm -hmm. a lot longer. Um, and they still haven't got anywhere near what they deserve as well. Or, you know, the variability of disability, um, more like say a potentially more observable disability. So, and this is the thing where we're stuck in that sort of catch 22, that if we don't disclose and, and ask for what we are rightfully owed in that workplace, you know, we're not going to get it because there needs to be more of us, needs to be more voices. It's such a difficult one. Mm -hmm. And then it's, and like I say, if um, it's all well and good me saying that if I'm feeling at this point in time, I'm able to create my own path of employment, I'm in that slightly privileged position. That makes it sound I really mm -hmm. don't have any money. <laughs> Just so everyone's clear, I work seven yeah. days a week, seven days a week of all different types of roles because I refuse to try and interview for a specific job that I, I don't want to be a grown up yet. I'm not ready. Um, <laughs> but but I think what you Been said there, about, that, no thanks. I think what you said about, um, you know, some people getting it right and things like that. So I wanted to um, read this comment out, which um, Leslie spoken about when we had C Katrina on as well, talking about employment, but I think it's lovely to get the point across is that some settings, okay, there's not enough might be better placed for neurodivergent people um, because they're probably run by neurodivergent people. So um, Leslie oh, yeah. says that her 21 year old son who's late discovered autistic and ADHD, the, their passion is gaming um, and he worked at game for two years. Um, fantastic nurturing team. He totally thrived at the outset. He was told he could take a vape break outside if he felt overwhelmed at any point. Um, and honestly, that's all he needed most shifts. Um, but yeah, so there was this, that's nice, yeah. you know, it's a gaming shop. So yeah. the majority are going to be, you know, nerdy or neurodivergent in some capacity, I would have thought as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the jobs that I don't 
mentioned in my, in, well, not in this presentation. There, there are different versions of that presentation. I'm sad I couldn't share the visual with you today. I, I love those visuals, they're fun. Um, but the, uh, so with the, with the presentation, I, 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 in the longer version, I share about time I worked in a local computer company. Well, it's not a local computer company. It's a big computer company. We all know this company. I'm not going to name them. Uh, but I worked in this com computer company. And uh, when I was there, it was one place that was so relaxed to me. I felt really at home there. It was one of my favorite jobs I ever had. But like in those companies, you get laid off. That was when I got laid off. The last time I was laid off from a job was in the crash of 2008. You know, go figure. This year, and I get laid off in Corona. I get laid off in 2008. Uh, but I didn't think that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Like it was recently, where I was like, "Yay, I got laid off. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me." <laughs> Whereas back then, it was terrifying. Um, but when I worked there in this big computer company in their engineering department with all of their engineering hardware working with all of their engineers i didn't need any accommodation it was like just naturally perfect because of the type of people that work there and my last comment because i want um i think that, uh, david's got another comment from a um a learner is that i mean at this point in time you know academy we don't make any money um, we take very, very small donations from from lovely learners who are happy to sp spend a pound to you know um, pay our, our guest speakers. Um, but it would be nice if at some point we could be an academy that can employ, you know, only autistic people. Um, so at this point in time, we've got lovely autistic volunteers helping out in the background. And I'm going to be getting a few more, um, you know, to help um, me because... I can't do it all by myself. The only thing I need to know about them is they're autistic. Otherwise, they're not allowed to work for Academy because that's the whole point or volunteer for Academy at this point in time. Um, and if I say this is what I would like, you know, these are the sorts of roles. And then that person says I can do that. That's personally, that's all I need to know. And then yeah. if they say, well, I, I could do that, but I'm not too sure or I need the skills or then I'm so up for just trying to support that person because and I don't want it you know as well I keep trying to make sure with Sai because Sai is working really really hard in the background all the time and I keep saying please can you because I haven't given him any structure or routine or anything around supporting <laughs> academy um, and the problem I think I have is that he's doing it all all the time and I'm kind of like can you tell yourself that you're only going to do this amount at this time or, or short amount of time because I don't want any of us to ever have to work like you know ridiculous hours I think the most comfortable for any um, person not just autistic people in you know sort of employment situation is just really relatively short hours <laughs> and I, yeah. I don't think we should work more than 30 hours a week anybody anyone I don't think anyone should be working 40 hours a week which is standard you know you get more done if you work less hours because you're fresher and you're more productive anyway. <laughs> exactly. Why do we do 40 hours a week or more? You know, I worked 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week for a while when I was like in high school and when I was younger in my early 20s. And I was like, now I'm like, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I can't keep that pace anymore. But I'm just like, why? And all of that time, you know, I could have done something else instead of hanging out in the fast food restaurant. But I loved that job. That was, that was a fun job somebody should put 30 hours all the way is optimal and I'm like no I'm quite happy if it, we, we could get it to a point, place where it's even, 20 even. That. yeah yeah 30 to 20 no more than that though you know like every now and then maybe you'd make work a long week and 30 would be a busy week and you'd be like yeah I, I think I'm, I'm much more effective if I work less hours and actually take time to go outside and do fun things and go out in the sun and play around yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't know how much work I do with all the stuff I do for, for since since getting into the uh, the advocacy world. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm never not doing something. <laughs> like <laughs> it's uh, it's got. You to gotta learn to turn it off, though. Well, it's got to the point where my fiance has actually told me that once Autism Acceptance Month is over, I'm taking a week off, and I don't get a choice in it. So. <laughs> yeah it's uh it yeah. does you know it's I, I think that's a it's a real risk isn't it when you're autistic is you're so determined to to do well because i think we all have that 
that perfectionist approach, don't we? We just no off switch. Yeah, there's no off switch. We just can't, you know. It's it's like inertia, but what you know, we get going and we can't change tracks or stop. You know, we just have, we maintain that momentum until we completely burn out, and it's just yeah, it's something that needs to change. I think, but um, I had we, to make the rules. <laughs> about not working outside of certain hours. It wasn't exactly my relationships and things. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> Go ahead. We have another comment from Hannah. And Hannah says, Lyric, I am often called unprofessional regarding autistic traits by faculty at my grad program, which is just the surface of the program's ableism. Do you have any insight to working through this? I'm not unprofessional. I just don't fit the neurotypical workplace. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like a what, what, uh, I wonder like what specific comments almost are being made that are unprofessional. But I can imagine, I can imagine what they are, but I'm like making some assumptions when I do that. But like, you know, for example, like I would get in one workplace uh, when I you know was entered the workplace and didn't know I was neurodivergent, for example, every like review I had it came up that oh there was a typo in that one email you had a typo in this email there was a typo in this email <laughs> you know to the point was like I by the time I left that job like I was so anxious about hitting send on an email like I would send an email and then be like unsend and I'd like reread it I'm like okay send it again and then I'd panic again like reject it like three times I couldn't send a dang email I was so afraid of having a typo because like they 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 did, like just drain this into me or that like I was getting scolded for um like not trying not making enough effort and this is ridiculous to like make relationships with my coworkers like not going to the happy hours and not hanging out with my coworkers on my lunch break and things like that this like what I was getting sold for in the workforce you know and it turned out like this was a workplace I didn't need to be in unfortunately in the end that's what that was in that situation because it was like you know and I, I had already said like eventually like it started out like I was having these troubles and then when I uh said I was autistic and said hey you know I'm autistic so like I really do need like downtime at lunch and I really I, I don't do as well in these like networking situations that you want me to go and do in these bars like and go do these networking things and meet strangers like I, I struggle with that and that's not something I'm, I'm good at I don't know that it's going to be something I'm ever going to be good at and it really stresses me out and it, it's it's hard on me and then then their response is well you know I wasn't good at this either and I'm an introvert and I you know this I change I'm an introvert and I'm not good at this either and I just had to try harder and you can push yourself you just need to keep pushing yourself harder and so that was the response. So it's like, it, it's really gonna depend on what the person on the other side is coming, gonna say when you tell them you know, this. Cause it sounds like you're already being kind of pushed to be someone you're not. And, and I hate that because that's what we get in the, a lot of workplaces right now, where it's like, we want one kind of employee, we want one, one kind of person, we want people to act a certain way. Um, but you know, it, it, depending on what it is, like if it's like, you know, you're not um, giving me enough eye contact and be like, actually, I, I'm neurodivergent and I'm autistic and I don't give eye contact, but is it going to be worth it to like say this to your employer? Because it sounds like the environment might be a little bit uh, less than favorable already because they're trying to change who you are without even necessarily knowing this diagnosis. They're trying to mold you into being someone else. And that's kind of problematic. I think what's kind of sad as well is that part of their sort of comment and question is do you have insight into working through this which sounds more a case of and, for, and correct me if I'm wrong Hannah it sounds more like how do I get through this as opposed to how do we actually fix it you know what can we do to get them to change their end um can I also if, if they're still here so Hannah if you're still here um so it says you you say on your grad program I did see that you had other comments I'm afraid I've lost a lot of them because they do go quite quickly um so they say they're on a grad program so am I to assume that you're a student so postgrad student potentially um and if that's the case um I can't I feel like they might have been in the US from the way they were writing because we don't tend to use the word faculty as much in the UK um the reason I'm asking is that 
even as a postgrad student, you should be able to get in the UK, it'll be called like an inclusive learning plan or something that you go to mm -hmm. student support. You tell them you're disabled in what way and they have to put it in your record so yeah. that, you know, the, your faculty or, or however, whatever um, terminology you use. Not to say that they will, but there's that legal document, if you like, almost to say, well, they haven't, you know, they, they've done mm -hmm. this, this and this, and that's actually gone against my inclusive learning plan. Um, and that did, should be easier in the US than in the, than in the workplace, like in the school. Yeah. To get that accommodation. If it's, if it's through an educational setting, even the university, that should be easier because the, the universities and the education systems do tend to be a bit ahead and more on board with those kinds of things. I mean, I did, um, I think I've mentioned before on one of the other lives, which is that uh, Annette and I wrote a chapter <clears throat> on being autistic in academia for a book on ableism in academia. So diff there was different um, chapters oh, wow. by, by different authors of different disabilities. Um, and so we wrote on being autistic. There's so many things about academia that are great for autistic people, but there's still that level of ableism that can be really problematic. Um, it sounds interesting because I think if I remember rightly from some of the comments, because I said, could you give some examples? And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't get to grab them as they went. Um, and I think there were things about clothing and, and things like that. I've not necessarily had that issue because academia in the UK, people kind of, you know, um, as an academic, most of our sort of superiors, if you like, you know they're they're relatively scruffy and that's sort of the academic look almost um yeah ah um yes we've we've gone quite a bit over we tend to do this because we get very excited when we're um, <laughs> having conversations um, it's fun i think we've kind of answered the majority of the other questions that came up which is good um the only other one i highlighted was do you have so this is from Terry. Do you have a prescripted answer for those objecting to your ideas of making workplaces more human friendly on the basis that they're a capitalist society not reaching for socialism? I mean, we don't get those sorts of comments in the UK because socialism isn't as a scary concept to us when you truly <laughs> understand true socialism. Um, I think and my biggest thing to remind people is that in businesses, humans are your greatest resource and happy, healthy humans, you know, are going to be more productive humans and your humans are going to be happier to have people who are different working with them. Like that diversity in your organization is good for everyone in your organization. Like, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Even it's, even if it's, you know, we don't look at it from a monetary perspective, it, it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have that diversity in your workplace. And, you know, we're talking about, it is the right thing to do. Like we can't convince all the businesses to do it for the right thing, but those that are looking at it from this other perspective, it is the right thing to do. <laughs> and it'll make your workplace better. It'll make your workplace more fun. For example, the last workplace I was in before I ended up being on my own, um, like something that I thought was important that was like a contrast to another workplace I had been in was we talked about like, how are you doing today? Like, how is your mental health? How are you? Like, how is every person, not just neurodivergent because in our last company, we just pretended we were fine all the time, right? And I was like, this is terrible. We shouldn't pretend we're fine. Like if someone's mental health isn't so good that day, let's have them speak up and that way we know and we can have love and compassion for that person. And that changed the way we operated and just, you know, having neurodivergent people being built willing to be vulnerable and speak up about their issues and their struggles like I found that the neurotypical people who also maybe had like additional mental health issues going on were willing to speak up about their mental health too so it was like everyone was so much more supportive it like created this different mindset in the workplace uh, to be able to talk about like openly and honestly about like hey I'm having a really hard day today my my mom's not doing well, or, you know, my, I just, I'm having a really hard time with my kids and I'm not sleeping, or, you know, I had this nightmare and it really messed me up. <laughs> you know, like people are able to be honest with things where it used to be like, I'm fine. Everything's good. And they'd be like the, the old way of thinking about work that doesn't work anymore since we had to force ourselves to working remote and you get to see people in their living rooms was leave home at home. 
you're at work now. I don't care if your dog died. You're here at work. I don't want to hear about it. That was like the only way to do things. And it was like it's removing such a the humanity. Way. Yes. You're asking people to put their humanity aside and be a freaking machine. That's not the future. That's that's like outdated. We're, we're, we need to move past that. And I think basically... It, it, I mean, Terry re responded as well and said, um, thank you, Lyric. I think that's a great approach versus debating a socioeconomic system and its pros and cons. Um, yeah, there's no point uh, at the end of the day if their purpose is to make money. So I think it goes back to what you said already earlier on, Lyric, which was that um, we still have to sell it to them, sadly, because that's yeah. the, the language that they understand. They don't necessarily... Like I say, there will be great people who will understand the need to just be more humane, but there will be they will be the ones that are already doing better anyway. Mm -hmm. Or they'll have the CFO in the company that they have, like maybe the person championing this does want to do it because it's the right reason. OK, and you'll meet someone who brings you in because they're passionate about all the right reasons. But they have to get it approved by their CFO and they take it to people in their organization than to say that this is worthwhile to do it, who may be naysayers and don't have a, an emotional connection to the cause and don't want to do it for the right reasons and say, well, this quarter we have this much coming in and I think this will cost this much to change and this doesn't seem logical. We can't do this right now. You know, so it's like you have to for those people because usually you know, people sometimes don't understand about business, especially when you go up in a big company. It's like you have one person that'll bring you in because they want you to come, but they're often not the final decision maker. And then there's like five people they've got to go to to say, hey, I really want to do this thing. Can we do this thing? And there's bureaucracy and all this stuff. So you have to like try to get through the big business bureaucracy to to get in there to get in the door it's not just like oh I want to do this and we can just do it it's you know it's not necessarily a one person decision especially in a big company lovely um and I think that's it because we like I say we are we've gone we've gone quite a bit over um and we've kind of answered everybody else's questions they kind of fitted in which was quite nice there was a couple of questions that weren't really related to the topic but I didn't want to not answer them um but somebody was asking quite early on um Chris was asking do you think um and I did answer but do you think or is there research into the neurodivergent people being uh, a hereditary based condition um I mean I'll quickly tell you how I responded but I said this is not quite the topic of employment but you know like I say although it's not I don't want to not answer their question um so I said most innate i.e neurodevelopmental neurodivergences so being autistic dyslexic dyspraxic and so on um have e evidence for estimates of heritability so they're a statistical estimate I teach this to my access course um people because we hear about heritability and we assume for some reason that that means that we can measure the genes for instance that are being <laughs> passed on but that's not what that means so we have estimates of heritability so we can statistically uh, guess if you like how likely if you've got an autistic parent a, a child's going to be autistic and vice versa um so you're you're more likely to be autistic if you've got close family members who are also autistic or other neurodivergences um, and then I just did my little caveat, which is for myself, um, hereditary estimates and looking for what is inherited. So biogenetic information. This is quite late for people sometimes here. Um, so I don't know if there's any of this is going to go in, um, which we don't know. We don't know the biogenetic um, correlates in the brain, for instance, for any or most neurodivergences. Um, I find it scientifically uninteresting to look for them. Um, I think that for me, I've say this all the time, research needs to focus on how to help us thrive, how to help us stay in employment and get employed, those kinds of things. So I'm not sure um, in what way or interest they were asking that particular question. But any, did you have any thoughts about hereditary? You know, I mean, we, we, we start to see a lot of the, the studies and the science says that way too and it's like you know if you ask autistic people it's like oh I'm a lot like my mom or like a lot of people will find out they're autistic because their kids they find out their kids autistic and they go oh well you know I, I'm just like that or you know a lot of autistic people like myself I feel like I wasn't found out that I was neurodivergent because to my family like all of my neurodivergent traits were normal 
and none of them were diagnosed with anything because you know, we're a bunch of eccentric, artistic, creative theater nerds, and my grandpa's an architect, and you know, like, so we we very naturally had kind of gone into the path that suited us as neurodivergent people, and then it's like we try to, like, shove ourselves into a system that isn't set up for us, and then it's, like, becomes a problem. It becomes diagnosable because we're, like, trying to press ourselves into a system that, you know, isn't, isn't complexing. Lovely. Thank you. And like I said, then my little caveat of I don't really care as in I don't yeah. you know we know we know that we're likely to be related to other autistic people so I guess it's um how useful that piece of information is it might be more useful I guess in terms of working out you are autistic if you know or working out that actually close family member who's been struggling <laughs> you know it's likely that you're also autistic um, but scientifically and in terms of research, I don't find it interesting as a question. Um, yeah. And the last thing, which um, you don't need to answer because, so this person, Marta, was asking, what is the best advice that a neurotypical parent can give to a neurodivergent child? Um, they didn't specify whether that was in regards to employment or anything like that. Um, and we're going to run out of time. But sorry, I've just seen the comment from Sai, who's just put because Sai can um, is somewhat demand avoidant, so he has some of that cheekiness, and he's put Chloe is actually my <laughs> uncle <laughs> in the comment <laughs> section. <laughs> um, so I love it. Um, <laughs> there's an inside joke there, I'm sure. There's not. It's because we're talking about hereditary and being oh, related okay, and okay, things. Okay, so okay. <laughs> I love it though. Okay. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that um, so Marta, if you're still here and, and anybody else, um, it actually it feeds in nicely. Next week we've got a double bill, although we seem to run over quite a lot anyway. We've got a double bill next week. So we start at 7 p.m. next week. Um, because we've got Sam Story, who is a young autistic man um, who's doing a session with Tigger on how to explain you're autistic or tell a, a child or a young person they're autistic so how they would like to hear that information so that's going to be lovely and then at eight o'clock we've got Dr Melanie Hayworth from Re Reframing Autism and she uh, co-wrote uh, a book on how to tell young people they're autistic so it's kind of like a, a double bill of how do we support our young people to be positive about their autistic identity so that's what we've got next week and I'm going to leave it to, to uh, David to wrap us up. So we have one question that we ask everyone at the end of these, these live streams. What is your favourite STEM? Ooh, my favourite. Uh, I guess, like, I would say favourite would be one I probably actively engage in intentionally, I would say, uh, versus the one I do the most frequently is probably anything with my hands. Uh, but my favourite is probably going to be, like, roller skating, because I can just constantly spin in circles and put music in and just dance. Like, dancing, you know, dancing in general, like, anything with music, like, music is my stem, lyric, that's the name, lyric, like, Music is my life, humans. There is always music in my head. I'm always singing to myself. I sing out random sentences and phrases instead of talking them. I don't know why. I, I'm a musical person. So music, anything with music. But lately, I, I've I've got my old roller skates out actually from when I was a Sonic car hop and restored them. I thought I broke them. I need to fix them again. Uh, and I've been like roller skating and things again. And that's been so much fun because it's like something from high school and middle school that was like so important to my life. And I stopped doing all of my fun sensory movement things when, when I like went into the corporate world because I was adulting which is no fun. Like no, I'm getting it all back out. Like all of it. And, uh, I'm so happy. It's like the best thing I've done in a long time. <laughs> and I think, was it David, was it you? Or it might be someone in the comment section was saying that they liked your little rocking while you've been talking. Oh, <laughs> that that's come out a lot more too, since like, especially since like COVID times and I'm like by myself all the time. I noticed yesterday when I was like sitting social distancing from my grandmother, who's just got her last vaccine. I'm so excited that my grandparents are vaccinated and we're gonna get to hug them soon. Uh, but when I was sitting like away from her and I realized I was doing it and it was like something I didn't used to do, I think when I was in front of other people so much. And now I'm like, I don't care, it's out there. Like I'm, I'm so, it just feels so natural to do. 
you know it feels good it's nice and David there's actually a question for you and then if we can finish dead on 10 o'clock we will make Sai who said if you finish at 10 dead on that will really make my OCD happy because <laughs> we've got like one minute um they want to know the manufacturer of your chair so there's been some comments earlier I don't know if you saw any of them David where people and particularly Sai and some of um uh, the people that are friends in the comment section making some lovely comments and jokes about what your chair is made of some of it was like part llama part something else <laughs> um yeah i don't know who the manufacturer of this chair is um i i i came to my fiance's house and uh and uh it's been here since i've been here um it, it was it was you know already it was a it was a permanent fixture when i arrived um and i've never thought to ask who manufactured it i'm pretty sure it's not made of llama um <laughs> Um, I could be wrong, but I... Uh, I think it was one of Sai's comments. It was a jokey thing and it was really funny, but I can't find it because it's quite far up, but it was something like, it's a quarter llama, a quarter this, a quarter maths teacher <laughs> or something. It was great. It was a great comment. I just I just love this chair. <laughs> like a I, I, I hate sitting in office chairs for long periods of time. So, so yeah, I just, I drag this armchair up whenever I'm doing live streams and stuff. Nice. That's nice. I've got springs of mine. <laughs> and then Ian, a little jokey. The lyric is so gangster, the lyrical gangster. <laughs> Thanks for that, Ian. Oh, it's gone one minute Fine. past. <gasps> so I, oh. I'm so sorry. Pretend if you if you logged out at 10, you're fine. Um, so yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Lyric. Um, it's been thank fantastic. You. Um, and people in the learner in the comment section. Um, we will see you next week. Fantastic for being here. I have been Chloe. With my I have been David. With David, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, humans. <laughs> no, I have to. Where's my stop try live streaming? Oh, there it is. <laughs>